From claims of healings and visions to the world's most inexplicable events, whether you're a believer or a skeptic, the truth truth, 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 truth. is always worth the hunt. EWTN Radio presents The Miracle Hunter with Michael O'Neill. Welcome to The Miracle Hunter Radio Show. This is Michael O'Neill. I'm The Miracle Hunter. Well, happy early Halloween, everyone. In two days, we'll be celebrating, uh, or at least the kids will be, uh, with uh, ghouls, goblins, and going around getting their candy. And this is a time of year where perhaps it's best to focus on the saints, which uh, follow uh, shortly thereafter. But uh, everybody does celebrate Halloween in one way or another. And in this time where we talk about those things that go bump in the night, uh, perhaps the best person we could ever talk to about this is Adam Bly. He's the Paratus of Religious Demonology from the Diocese of Pittsburgh. And he's author of this brand new book from Sophia Institute Press called The Exorcism Files, True Stories of Demonic Possession. I couldn't think of a better person to talk to today than somebody who's the real deal, who has really been on the inside of exorcisms and can give us some insights from his new book about what really happens. We'll also be talking today with David Nallieri, the award-winning director and producer of this brand new film, Mother Teresa, No Greater Love. Uh, This uh, debuted in theaters in October for one night only, and now it's back for an encore on November 2nd. Mother Teresa, No Greater Love is uh, in theaters in Spanish. It'll be out November 7th. But if you want to uh, find out more about this movie and purchase tickets, you can go to MotherTeresaMovie.com, and we'll be excited to talk to David uh, later in the show. And, of course, uh, we've got They Might Be Saints coming up every Friday. And for this week, uh, on Friday at 5 p.m. Eastern Time, we have They Might Be Saints Rota Wise. Uh, if you missed this episode when it aired to much fanfare uh, on EWTN, of course, with the EWTN connection, it's back on the air again. So this is the time to watch it. In Canton, Ohio, Rhoda Wise was a well-known mystic with many spiritual gifts and healing miracles. And one of them was experienced by Rita Rizzo, the former uh, or the future Mother Angelica. So I'll be exploring her remarkable story that has had such a big impact on the history of EWTN. So check that one out on Friday, November 4th at 4 p.m. Uh, Central Time. And I'm so excited to announce that uh, later uh, this month, we'll, or next month, in November 5th at 5 p.m. Central Time, will be the, the airing of the new uh, episodes for Explore with the Miracle Hunter. People who have been watching that show over the months know that uh, they've been on reruns for the past few months, but now we've got seven new episodes that are coming out, and I think people are going to be excited about this because we have uh, places like uh, Bano in Belgium, one of the most famous Marian apparitions in history, Rome, this incredible uh, uh, conversion story with Alphonse Radisbone. Genizzano, the place in Italy with this miraculous image, one of the most famous uh, that that Catholic history has ever seen. And it'll be followed by uh, three others other than that after that. So, uh, so excited that the new episodes will be coming out so people can go to EWTN.com and uh, find the show there. uh, Explore with the Miracle Hunter for all these dates. So they're always on Saturdays at 5 p.m. Central Time over the next seven weeks. So very excited uh, that that will be debuting soon. Later in the show, we're going to look at the 365 Days with Mary project in Piedmont in Italy in the 3rd century. The might-be saint of the day for today is Blessed Chiara Badano, 1971 to 1990, from Italy. And there's a question of the week. It's a good one. Can there be any medical treatment in a healing miracle used in beatification or canonization? We'll try to answer that one later in the show. Let's take a look at the miracle news. Each week we try to report on the miracles happening around the world and those things that relate to miracles. And one of the uh, perhaps most famous, most popular, uh, with greatest devotion amongst alleged apparitions, we talk about Medjugorje, of course, those apparitions in 1981 to the six children there that have been going on for 40 years. But in second place, you might say, and I'm basing this all on emails I get to my Miracle Hunter email account, is are the alleged apparitions that happened in 1961 to 1965 in San Sebastián de Garbandal in Spain called Garbandal for short. And what's interesting about these apparitions, and people who are familiar with this, they've probably seen the the film footage of the children receiving visions and uh, experiencing these ecstasies and walking around on the top of this this mountain or hill and walking backwards and looking up to the sky. It's very very strange and interesting. Um, But, you know, many people have a devotion to Mary under this title, 
But what's interesting is that the local bishop has never approved it, never condemned it. And uh, all the statements of the local bishops always harken back to that very first judgment from the local bishop when he said, non constate supernaturalitate, or non, no constaba in Spanish, where he says it's not established as supernatural. So it's not condemned, not approved. They just don't have enough information. The big news this week was the Bishop of Santander, Bishop Sanchez Monge, has stated regarding the extraordinary events of Agar and Vidal that, quote, my position, like that of my predecessors, is that Rome's asses assessment remains valid. There are no signs of supernaturality. Again, that's a statement of uh, non constate supernaturalitate. There's, no, there's nothing that can establish this as a supernatural event, according to the recent bishop's statement. So in addition, he acknowledged that he contacted this uh, center of San Pablo Center of University Studies, and he's, he's uh, expressing his... Uh, is this pleasure that uh, that they've been promoting the Garabandal message there and holding events related to that? So he took that occasion to sort of censure them in some ways and and uh, and say that all, all Garabandal related events needs to be cleared with him first. He took this occasion to actually uh, go out and uh, make a statement about Garabandal. So he follows in the line of all his successors who have said that there's nothing supernatural here. So uh, you can go to miraclehunter.com and look for Garabandal for more information on it. But as of right now, it stands as an unapproved Marian apparition. Let's take a look at Catholic Pub Trivia. Each week, I ask a trivia question and give out a prize to an emailer who writes in with the fastest with the correct answer. Last week, we talked about Father Augustus Tolton, and we interviewed Bishop Joseph Perry, and that relates to the television series They Might Be Saints, which aired two weeks in a row, this new episode of Father Augustus Tolton. And so the question was, uh, Father Tolton is the most recently declared venerable in the year 2019, and so the question was, who was the most recent venerable before that? And it's a tough one. It's it's one that a name that most Americans don't know. It's Antionetta Gi Giuliano, the co-founder of the Little Servants of Christ the King. Uh, she was born and lived in New York and moved to Naples, Italy at some point in her life. But she was declared venerable on December 21st, 2018. A very hard trivia question last week. Here's one, though, I think that some people will know. We're talking today with David Nallieri, the award-winning uh, director and producer of this new film on Mother Teresa, Mother Teresa, A No Greater Love. And uh, people always know of her great work in India, but that's not where she was born. So the trivia question is, what, in what country was Mother Teresa born? If you think you know that answer and want to win the prize, the image of the faces of Mary, send me an email to miraclehunter at ewtn.com or just go to my website, uh, miraclehunter.com, and send me a mes message that way. And the answers and winners will be posted on the show page on miraclehunter.com. We need to take a short break, but when we come back, we're going to be talking with David Nallieri, the director and producer of the new film Mother Teresa, No Greater Love, which is airing on, in theaters on November 2nd only. Stay with us for that. Now, back to the Miracle Hunter on EWTN. Here's Michael O'Neill. Welcome back. You're listening to the Miracle Hunter radio show on EWTN radio. This is Michael O'Neill. I'm the Miracle Hunter. So this past month, we celebrated Mother Teresa in a big way. And there was a film produced by the Knights of Columbus that actually made it into theaters uh, for a day or so uh, that had a huge attendance and it was a big success. Uh, Catholic media uh, of all sorts covered this one. It was a big deal. And the producer and director of that film is David Nallieri. And the name of the film is called Mother Teresa, No Greater Love. It's great to reconnect with David. Welcome back to the show, David. Thank you, Michael. Great to be with you, as always. Appreciate it. It's great to chat with you again. And, of course, uh, we worked together on the uh, They Might Be Saints episode for Father Michael McGivney, so I'm fam very familiar with your work. And this one, this Mother Teresa No Greater Love, was a big deal. This was spread far and wide uh, in theaters, and it's back in theaters uh, for one night only on November 2nd. So this is a great opportunity to for people who missed it to see the encore in theaters uh, today. So tell us, right out of the gate, how can people see this film? Yeah, so we're very excited that it's going to be back at theaters. As you mentioned, that it's going to be in about 7,800 theaters across the United States on November the 2nd. Um, it's All Souls Day, and tickets are available at MotherTeresaMovie.com. That's our film's website. You can see the trailer or learn a lot more about the film. As an option to click on tickets, 
and um, and you could put in your zip code or your city and see if there's a theater playing near you. And with, and with seven, eight hundred theaters, a good chance that you'll have a theater uh, near your home, hopefully. Um, and there's opp- opportunities to buy either group or tick, uh, group or individual tickets. So it's um, November the second nationwide. And then if you're Hispanic or Spanish speaker or know someone who is a Spanish speaker, we are also going to have a Spanish dubbed version theatric release. That's going to be on November the seventh. And it's the same website, MotherTeresaMovie.com, where you can get tickets for the Spanish release as well. So uh, we're very excited about it. It comes also having theatrical releases at the same time in Canada and the United Kingdom. So we really set it as an opportunity to get the message of Mother Teresa out to a wider audience. Wonderful. The name of the film is Mother Teresa, No Greater Love, and I really encourage people to check this one out. It's a good one, and I think that we have the big anniversary uh, related to uh, Mother Teresa uh, this this October, and so it's great that this is back in theaters again. And David, when you did this film, of course, anytime you do a film, you uh, a person will dig into the, the content in, in a way that you wouldn't uh, normally have heard about. But everybody knows about Mother Teresa. What did you learn when you did this film, No Greater Love? Yeah, you know, I think um, I think I had a general, what I would call a general knowledge of Mother Teresa. Obviously, she's one of the most famous uh, women in the history of the world and uh, a great Catholic icon and um, known by, by all. But uh, as you mentioned, it, sometimes there's a lot of details that go lost. I never read a detailed biography of her. So what I, what, one of the things that really struck me was a family dynamic. I knew very little about Mother Teresa's family. So growing up in Skopje, which is present-day northern Macedonia, as an ethnic Albanian, she was very much shaped by her background, a very close family, uh, a wealthy family, not super rich, but not a poor family. Her father was a very successful businessman. Um, and he was Albanian, and there was a little bit of a conflict that existed between the Albanian minority and the Serbians. Um, he gets involved after a, a war that took place, the Balkans War in 1912-13. He gets involved in politics, goes to a meeting to kind of um, advocate for the Albanian cause, and winds up um, being poisoned and murdered. And Mother Teresa never talked about this, but they say that's one of the reasons why she never wanted to become active in politics, because of that linkage to her father's involvement. And she said, if I get involved in politics, I cannot love. But I think the death of her father at the age of nine really helped shape Mother Teresa and helped, I think, give her an understanding of her need to embrace suffering in her life, which obviously becomes a very powerful theme throughout her life. And then the relationship with her mother and sister, you know, leaving home at age 18, her mother saying to her at the train station, put your hand into the hand of Jesus and never look back. And she never did, of course. And she never saw her mother and her sister again. Um, They fell under communist rule after World War II in Albania. If Mother Teresa entered the country, she would not be able to leave. So therefore, she could not continue God's call um, to serve the poorest of the poor. Um, And so she had to suffer greatly, never seeing her mother and sister again. And so for me, I was very struck by the family dynamic of Mother Teresa and how that um, really helped shape her and mold her, and just another example of somebody who's willing to suffer everything to serve Christ and to serve the poorest of the poor, um, even to the point of of never seeing her mother and sister again. So there's many things that could take away, you know, Michael, but I think the family dynamic was one that really struck me that I did not have the knowledge of going in. Yeah, that's that's a, those are amazing details, and people can find out more in the film Mother Teresa: No Greater Love, which airs one night only on November second. Uh, people can go to MotherTeresaMovie dot com for more information. And David, when we talk about Mother Teresa, she had so many awards and accolades, and uh, and uh, even even becoming an honorary a citizen of the United States over the years. But looking at Mother Teresa and what you learned of her, what would you say was Mother Teresa's greatest accomplishment in all that she did in her life? Well, that's a tough question to answer because she did accomplish a lot. But but I think I'll approach the question this way. I think Mother Teresa um, is the perfect embodiment of finding that, that balance and that harmony between justice and mercy, love and truth. And she really shows us how to live our faith in today's world. Um, and what do I mean by that? What I mean is that Mother Teresa had the courage in 1979, and not just then, but of course her famous speech when she wins the Nobel Peace Prize, and she's there with all the leaders, the global leaders, the who's who in the world, and she shocks them when she makes the focus of her speech on abortion. And she says, I think the greatest uh, suffering, the greatest uh, destroyer of peace is abortion. And I think the poorest nations are the liberal Western nations who have liberalized abortion. 
And this shocked a lot of people. But that shows her courage. And she did it time and time again, even at the 1994 National Prayer Breakfast. Many times when, you know, in meetings with pro-choice and pro-abortion politicians. So she was a woman of great courage, moral courage, who did not in any way sacrifice or, or downplay the Church's moral teachings. At the same time, she was a perfect kind of embodiment of the merciful love of God. And she brought that mercy of God wherever she was. And in the film, we, we, we have a lot of testimonials of people who are immersed in lives of sin, who are drug addicts, who are going through all different great sufferings. And they came to their faith because they experienced the mercy of Jesus that just flowed out of her. And so I think Mother Teresa teaches us uh, as Catholics today how we can stand strong and courageous for the, the important moral teachings that the Church must bring to bear in the, in the world and in the culture, at the same time reflecting God's love and God's mercy. And I think a lot of times it's very easy to, to swing to one side or the other and to lose a little bit of an aspect, an important aspect of the other side. And that's where I think for me personally, but I think for many, Mother Teresa can be a great inspiration and she can very much be a saint for our time. Absolutely. And as you point out, she's one of the most famous women in the history of the world. It's a, it's an amazing documentary, Mother Teresa, No Greater Love, out in theaters on November 2nd. And every time I do a, a program, I always walk away with in an interview or a segment that I say, this was my favorite. This, to me, makes the piece. What was your favorite uh, interview or tidbit that came up uh, when you were producing this film, uh, No Greater Love? Well, I was really struck by the testimony of Jim Wahlberg. And Jim, of course, is the older brother of Mark Wahlberg, the famous actor. Um, and Jim runs the Mark Wahlberg Foundation. And I didn't know much about his background with Mother Teresa, but the missionaries of charity were like, oh, you got to tell this story. And we have him film. But Jim Jim was a troubled youth from, from the Boston area, uh, got involved in drugs, got involved in gangs, got involved in crime. And as a young man was arrested for uh, breaking into the home of a police officer and got a six to nine year prison sentence. Hmm. And he talked in the film about how growing up, he didn't have an idea of a merciful God. For him, God was scary. He was the God out to get you if you do something wrong. And, um, and, and, and Mother Teresa came to visit uh, his prison. And he was very skeptical, kind of poo-pooed it. Uh, but when she got up and started to speak, he was very much struck. He was struck by the Holy Spirit. And he felt in her presence, he saw the loving, merciful face of Jesus. Um, and her words transformed his life. He went back to his prison cell, and he said to the prison chaplain, please tell me more about this Jesus. I have to learn more about this Jesus she mm. talked about, and not the Jesus I grew up with. And that wound up leading to a real conversion experience, and Jim now is a very accomplished Catholic speaker and evangelist, and someone who's really living his faith. But I think um, that story by Jim really shows the impact that Mother Teresa had, and the way she was able to just be this amazing font of, 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 of graces um, that touched so many people during her life. Absolutely. We're talking today with David Nallieri, director and producer of Mother Teresa, No Greater Love, a film from the Knights of Columbus that's making it into theaters for an encore on November 2nd, one night only. And when we talk about Mother Teresa, one of the very common phrases when she was living was, uh, she's a living saint. Everybody said that. But when we talk about uh, sainthood in the Catholic Church, there's a whole process that has to go from servant of God when the cause is open, venerable, their life of heroic virtue is established, and in the case of Mother Teresa, no doubt about that. But you do need those two miracles to advance from blessed and then saint. And uh, this film, and it, I, I really enjoy anything related to miracles, of course, people know from my, from my shows, but you highlight a, a miracle uh, that, that leads to her canonization. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so the miracle that led to Mother Teresa's canonization we profile in the film, and I was limited to how much uh, travel I could do because we, 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 we produced this film in a record amount of time. So I had crews all over the world filming the film in 10 different countries mm -hmm. and all five continents. And, but the one I did go to uh, in Brazil, I'm really glad I did. We did a lot of filming in Brazil. And uh, the miracle that led to the canonization took place in, uh, in Rio de Janeiro. And there was an engineer by the name of Marcelio, and uh, he got married to his wonderful wife, and uh, he started experiencing a lot of different symptoms that ultimately came down to abscesses in his brain. And he had so many abscesses in his brain that there was, it was incompatible with life and was going to lead to his death. And then around 2008, um, it got very, very serious, 
and they were going to have to operate, and it looked very, very bleak. Um, they had a parish priest who knew about Mother Teresa, had a devotion to Mother Teresa, and did have access to a relic. And um, so he said, please pray uh, for Marsilio and, and use this relic. So uh, Marsilio's wife took the relic and spent a long period of time, the night before surgery, as the abscesses were continuing to swell in his brain, uh, praying over uh, uh, Marsilio, placing the, the relic on his head, and, um, and then went home. And the next morning, when his wife came back to the hospital, all the abscesses were gone. Um, and this was unprecedented. There was absolutely no medical explanation for this. Um, and, uh, and the doctors all wound up testifying that this was, you know, a miracle in the sense that there was no uh, medical explanation for how these uh, different brain abscesses, and there was many, many abscesses. I think you can survive with a certain number, but he had an extraordinary number of the swelling, leading to the swelling. So this, of course, goes through all the Vatican research and uh, the processes that, Michael, you're the worldwide expert on. And, uh, and it was eventually proved as the miracle. And it's a very beautiful story. Now, this family also feels it's a secondary miracle because, uh, because of all his health problems. Marcelo was taking a lot of medications, and the doctors had told him that you will never be able to conceive children due to uh, the medications he was on. And shortly after the healing, they didn't conceive their first child, and they wound up having three beautiful children. They were present at the 2016 uh, canonization of Mother Teresa. And so it's a very beautiful story, and that is included in the documentary. And I think it just kind of helps tell the full story of Mother Teresa. And the other thing I'll say, Michael, just in terms of the time I spent with the Missionaries of Charity um, in, the, in the work producing this film, one of the things they told me is there are so many miracles that continue to happen, that they continue to be informed about, of people who, repeat, you know, ask, pray to Mother Teresa for her intercession, uh, for all kinds of looking for a job, or um, infertility issues, and they're just hearing so many uh, incredible stories of her intercessory powers, which, of course, is not surprising, but just something to remind your viewers that, you know, we have a great intercessor in Mother Teresa available to us. That's wonderful. And you read my mind on that one, David. We know these uh, famous miracles used for canonization, but what about even today? Those miracles still continue on. That's absolutely amazing. And we've been talking today with David Nallieri, director and producer of Mother Teresa, No Greater Love, a film from the Knights of Columbus that airs uh, in, or is in theaters on one night only. That's November 2nd. If you missed it in, earlier in October, this is your chance. This is the encore uh, to see this film. As we wrap up the interview today, David, remind us how people can get tickets to this uh, how they can figure out in their area where this is showing. Yes, thank you, Michael. Our website is MotherTeresaMovie.com. That's MotherTeresaMovie.com. There's no H in, the, in Teresa. And uh, there you can, you can find tickets for our November 2nd theatrical release. We're going to be about 750 to 800 theaters across the country. It's going to be at 7 p.m. Um, everywhere that it's playing. And it's another opportunity to watch it. And also November 7th in Spanish. If you know anybody who's Spanish-speaking, Hispanics, Catholics, we have a dubbed Spanish version, very high quality, um, that's going to be in theaters uh, across the country in Hispanic markets on November the 7th. Wonderful. Well, we're so grateful to you, David Nallieri, for joining us on today's program and for your incredible work directing and producing this beautiful film, Mother Teresa, No Greater Love. Thank you so much for joining us on the program today. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate the opportunity. God bless. That was David Nallieri, director, producer of Mother Teresa, No Greater Love, a beautiful film out from the Knights of Columbus that's in theaters for one night only on November 2nd. It's the encore. If you missed it in October, this is your chance. Check out MotherTeresaMovie.com for more information and to get tickets. We need to take a short break, but when we come back, we're going to be looking at the question of the week. Can there be any medical treatment in a healing miracle used for beatification and canonization? Stay with us for that. Now, back to the Miracle Hunter on EWTN. Here's Michael O'Neill. Welcome back. You're listening to the Miracle Hunter radio show on EWTN radio. This is Michael O'Neill. I'm the Miracle Hunter. Hey, I love getting your questions. People write in from around the world with questions about miracles happening in today's world and those that have happened centuries ago. And there's a lot of talk on this show and and on the program, They Might Be Saints, which airs on EWTN television on Fridays at 4 p.m. Central Time. We talk a lot about the sainthood process, how you advance from servant of God to venerable, to blessed, to saint. And to move on from venerable, where your life of heroic virtue has been established, two miracles, one for beatification and one for canonization, are needed. 
And so the question today we get from Matt in Chicago. He says, uh, can there be any medical treatment in a healing miracle used in a beatification or canonization? So uh, so it's a great question. So the criteria are something like this. Uh, this is from uh, um, Prospero Lambertini, who went on to become Pope Benedict XIV. Uh, he, he was born in the 1600s. And these are the, these are the criteria that the church still uses, even in our modern world, uh, the, question, the criteria is it must be a serious condition, not liable to go in its own. It must be an instantaneous, complete and lasting cure. And uh, there can be no medical treatment that relates to the cure. And so that's the question for today from, from Matt. He says, uh, can there be any medical treatment? And the answer is yes. So there can be no effective uh, medical treatment, though. That's the hook. So you can't... Um, if uh, if you have cancer and you take an aspirin, for example, or you're treated for some some other uh, sickness that's not related to the cancer, then that's okay. That doesn't relate to the cure of of the cancer. If you have chemotherapy, however, and that has a known effectiveness with cancer, then the church won't say, "Well, we're pretty sure your future saint worked the miracle, but the the chemo had nothing to do with it." They'll say, "This is perhaps your healing is due to uh, the you know." God working through a good doctor. And so uh, so it has to be these cases where n- medical treatment has not been yet applied or a case where medical treatment is ineffective or unrelated. So the answer, Matt, to your question is yes, there can be medical treatment in these uh, canonization and beatification miracles. They just can't uh, be potentially the reason for the cure. So thanks for that great question. If you have a question for the Miracle Hunter, you can go to my website, miraclehunter.com. And maybe we'll be answering your question on the air next week. Let's take a look at the 365 Days with Mary project. For today's date, we've got Our Lady of Oropa from Piedmont in Italy in the 3rd century. And the story goes that in Piedmont, there lies the mountain of Europa, which is a complex of 19 chapels and several shelters that were built in a land where Our Lady wanted to settle. And within the complex is the ancient image of the Black Madonna of Oropa. Her veneration was introduced by San Eusebio, who in the 3rd century brought from the Holy Land a sculpture of the Virgin that is believed to be sculpted by the community of St. Luke the Evangelist. Since then, the Virgin Mary has worked a number of miracles and wonders, conversions and graces in the supernatural order, and this location was recognized by UNESCO as a World Heritage Site. And that is Our Lady of Europa from Piedmont in Italy in the 3rd century. For more information on this fascinating devotion, or any of the hundreds of other Marian devotions from around the world, you can go to the website 365dayswithmary.com. You can pick up the book of that same title, or you can download the free app from the iOS App Store, 365 Days with Mary, Marian Calendar. And you can see the Marian devotion for each and every day of the calendar year, or join the Facebook feed with uh, 10,000 other followers who find out the Marian devotion of the day. Let's take a look at the sainthood news. Every week we do this where we talk about the uh, people advancing along the path to sainthood. We're talking about uh, servants of God, venerables and blesseds. And uh, these are people who need their miracles before they become saints. So um, there was interesting news that uh, just came out uh, as far as a new beatification. There's another Maria Goretti who was just beatified in Brazil. Her name is 12-year-old Benina Cardosa da Silva, and she was killed by her would-be rapist. And on October 24th, her feast day, Begnina was beatified. Pope Francis spoke about her example that week at the end of the Wednesday Journal audience, speaking of her as a, quote, young martyr who, keeping the word of God, kept her life pure, defending her dignity. May her example help us to be generous disciples of Christ, and our consistent and joyful witness to the gospel depends the life of the world. End quote. So that was Pope Francis talking about uh, this new uh, martyr of purity, as Saint Maria Goretti has been known. Uh, she was uh, fighting. She was the. She fought a young man who had assaulted her and asked him not to sin to the point of losing her life. And since her canonization in 1950, the Church has recognized other individuals with some similar stories. And the very recent example, as I mentioned, is Benina Cordosa da Silva, this holy 12-year-old girl living in Santana de Carini. Brazil. In an early age, she had a desire to receive the Eucharist, 
and after making her first communion, she was firm in her resolution to keep the Ten Commandments, and uh, she lived a life of heroic virtue, you might say, as well. And so this is another case similar to Maria Goretti. You can find out more on the Facebook page of the Miracle Hunter. I've got this uh, article posted from Catholic News Agency with more information about uh, this brand new blessed in our Catholic Church. Let's take a look at the might be saint of the day. We do this every week where we talk about the uh, venerable, blessed, before they're becoming a saint. And so we're talking about today, blessed Chiara Badano, who lived from 1971 to 1990. So a very modern saint. And she was born on October 29th in 1971 in Savona, Italy. And she's a young laywoman in the Diocese of Acquitera, Terme, in Italy. And she's the daughter of Ruggero Badano, a truck driver, and Marisa Teresa Caviglia. She was known to be a kind, happy, and pious girl. She enjoyed tennis, swimming, hiking, singing, dancing, and wanted to be a flight attendant. And she was a member of the Focolare movement at the age of nine. And at the age of 16, she began to feel drawn to religious life. And soon afterwards, she was diagnosed with cancer in her shoulder. Kiara insisted that she could become a missionary, but the cancer spread quickly, affecting her spine, and she lost the use of her legs. She finally accepted that she wasn't going anywhere and spent her remaining time praying and being supportive of her family and friends. And she died on October 7, 1990 in Sassello Savona in Italy of natural causes. She was declared venerable by Pope Benedict XVI in 2008 and was beatified in 2010, again by Pope Benedict XVI. So the might-be saint of the day is Blessed Chiara Badano from Italy with one more miracle. She will be declared a saint. And for people who are interested in the television series, They Might Be Saints, which airs on Fridays at 5 p.m. Eastern Time on EWTN, uh, this week's episode is about Rhoda Wise. This is an episode that aired previously a few weeks ago, but it's re-airing, and this is your chance to watch it. This incredible woman from Canton, this mystic and stigmatic and uh, uh, with incredible healing surrounding her, including that of Rita Rizzo, the future mother Angelica. So there's a real EWTN connection to this. Without uh, without Rita Rizzo, uh, there's no EWTN. Without uh, Rhoda Wise, perhaps Rita Rizzo doesn't go on to become Mother Angelica. So absolutely a fascinating story. So check that one out on Friday at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. We need to take a short break, but when we come back, we're going to be talking with one of my favorite guests, Adam Bly, the Paratus of Religious Demonology from the Diocese of Pittsburgh, about his brand new book, The Exorcism Files, True Stories of Demonic Possession. Stay with us for some harrowing tales. We'll be right back. Now, back to the Miracle Hunter on EWTN. Here's Michael O'Neill. Welcome back. You're listening to the Miracle Hunter radio show on EWTN radio. This is Michael O'Neill. I'm the Miracle Hunter. Well, around Halloween, we always do an episode related to uh, demonic possession and those things that uh, perhaps are on the darker side. We always uh, try to keep things uh, light and focused on the good, but there we have to acknowledge uh, the uh, existence of Satan and uh, his work in our world. And there's perhaps no greater expert to have on the program to talk about demonic possession, exorcism, and to uh, to talk about some of these incredible stories. And I think that with these in, in stories, we, uh, we always want to be oriented towards the light, towards the good. And uh, the supernatural realities that are, are presented, uh, they, can, they can turn us that way, despite uh, some people might find them uh, scary or problematic or difficult to hear. I think uh, they can embolden our faith when we see that uh, how our Lord can overcome uh, these, uh, these situations uh, in exorcism. And the person I refer to, of course, is Adam Bly. He's the Paratux of Religious Demonology for the Diocese of Pittsburgh and the author of a brand new book called The Exorcism File. True Stories of Demonic Possession. Uh, thank you again, Adam Bly, for joining us on today's program. Oh, thank you for having me, Michael. It's good to be back. Yeah, it's great to chat with you about this. And of course, uh, this is the time of year when when people put their focus on, on, on this subject matter in an extraordinary way. And I'm sure you're incredibly busy. So we're so grateful for you making the time for this show. And the name of this new book is called The Exorcism Files. I, I'm guessing that uh, this book was requested from you for some time over the years uh, to put these true stories of demonic possession down in print uh, for people to to see. What inspired this book at this time? Well, Michael, 
what I'm seeing, and I think a lot of people are seeing, is that um, we're not only not catechizing uh, the people coming up in our in our culture these days in terms of what's dangerous, what's good to be doing, you know, what's not good to be doing spiritually, religiously, but we're actually encouraging the things that we used to avoid. Hmm. And so uh, I see that in the movies, I see that in the TV shows, uh, in the books that are being put out for young people, you know, in a number of different areas. And so I, I hesitated to write this book for a long time mm-hmm. um, because I think you have to be careful and not go too far to where it's glorifying or just telling a scary story, mm-hmm. but you want to share enough to share the message of the case. And so I just feel that instead of just saying you shouldn't do these things, I wanted to share stories of what happened when people did these things. That's right. I think it's it's a it's an incredible contribution. This book. I mean, I think that people need to know of and I, and I know what you're saying. You don't want to just present a scary story uh, for people's enjoyment that way. I think it's so important that people uh, are, are tuned into the reality of what can happen if you go down the wrong path. And one of the the chapters of the book that I find fascinating is related to this idea of Wicca and witchcraft is, is there some people will, will will almost laugh at this idea that there's no such thing, but Wicca is a very real thing that can lead people down the wrong path. So let's talk about uh, that chapter in your book, Wicca, witchcraft and fables and why, why this is uh, so dangerous for people to be involved with. Yeah. So Wicca is not an ancient pre-Christian religion. It it actually has a well-known history that goes back to the 60s and the 70s. And, you know, a man named Gerald Gardner, um, who combined Aleister Crowley's black magic with some Freemasonry and his own ideas, and uh, then got an interview on the BBC that went global on, you know, BBC television and uh, started the whole ball rolling with Wicca. Uh, The danger with Wicca is that, of course, you're turning to a spirit other than God and asking it for favors, uh, whether that's power, information, or some comfort about the afterlife. And when we do that, we violate the first commandment, because we're not putting God first, and we're telling God, I don't trust you, I want help from this other created spirit over here. And so that's the core problem with it. It's not that it's witchcraft, it's that it's a violation of the First Commandment. And in this case, uh, I'm sure, you, as, as a, as a paratus of religious demonology for the Diocese of Pittsburgh, I'm sure you see this all the time, where people are dabbling in something that they shouldn't. Is it more than something that we're just not putting our focus on Christ and we're getting distracted? Or is there something actually dangerous about uh, opening yourself up to this? Right. So... Um, there's there's a one example in the book from a real case, and of course, change all the details, uh, you know, about who people's names and where they're from and where the case happened. Um, but as an example, there was a woman who had a relative who was into Wicca and witchcraft, and she thought it was neat when she was very little that her relative was doing this. And she got a little older, and she did a spell out of a book on a boy that was mean to her, and uh, didn't think think it would actually work. This was the first time she had played around with this, and it did work. And the boy was out of school for a few days, came back, apologized to her, and said, please don't hurt me anymore. <laughs> um, and that's terrified her so badly that she threw out all the books, didn't touch it again, didn't dabble in it at all. But what she said was, she could never explain why, but she just never went to church again. Mm. For the next 10 years, no confession, no mass, no prayer, no rosaries. She dropped all of her Catholic faith, but she couldn't explain why. And nothing bad happened. And then about 10 years later, the family convinced her to go to Mass at Easter with them. And as she, she had a great experience at Mass, felt wonderful. And as she was walking out of the church, she felt a burning across her forehead and was scratched across her forehead, and and there was a little bit of blood, not a lot, but a little blood, and got violently ill. And it was at that moment she realized that she had had a problem from that invitation all those years ago. But it was laying low because she was doing what it wanted. It was winning, Mm -hmm. and it had no reason to show itself to her until she did something it didn't like. Mm 
Yeah, incredible. We're talking today with Adam Bly, Paratus of Religious Demonology for the Diocese of Pittsburgh, uh, talking to us about this brand new book, Exorcism Files, Stories of Demonic Possession. And Adam, I think one of the more remarkable things that uh, that we've talked about in the past that, uh, I don't know, it's, it's, it's really remarkable, is that uh, the discernment of relics. And I think that uh, everybody kind of wants to know what happens behind the scenes at exorcisms, and that's your job to be uh, to be a, a witness to these things, or a part of these things, or shepherd people uh, through the process of exorcism. Um, and people want to know what happens uh, when you when uh, during an exorcism, an evil spirit is encountered, and a, a relic perhaps is brought into the room. Uh, Talk, talk to us about an example from the book where, uh, where a relic is identified by, uh, by an evil spirit. Yeah, so we had uh, a relic that we didn't have paperwork on, but we suspected was real. It had come, it was a hair that had come from one of the gloves that Padre Pio owned. Mm. Uh, so we knew it came from the glove, but it wasn't mounted, it didn't, didn't have paperwork. And it was in a cellophane bag. And we had an ongoing case, uh, and this person, you know, we knew was possessed. And in the human state, before the prayer started, we were just chatting, and, you know, they're completely normal. I asked them if they would hold this cellophane bag and tell me if they had any impressions or reactions. As soon as I handed them the bag, they kind of doubled over in the chair and said it felt like, you know, a terrible splitting headache. And I said, but can you tell me anything about this bag? Now, you couldn't see this one little gray Mm. hair in the bag at all. I just said, can you tell me anything about it? And he said, well, I don't know what you mean. And I said, well, is it associated with a person, a place, a thing? He said, well, it's a person. Well, is it a man or a woman? Oh, it's definitely a man. Mm. Um, Can you tell me, you know, is he older, is he younger? Well, I, I see an older man. Does he have a beard or not? Yeah, he has a he has a beard. You know, what color clothes is he wearing? And on like that. <laughs> and he described Padre Pio, you know, very well. And I didn't say the name Padre Pio after I'd asked a number of these kind of questions. He looked at me and he said, you know, I think it's Padre Pio, and I feel like he's blessing me. Hmm. And so, you know, this is just one example. We use relics all the time in exorcism as an assistance, you know, to... Uh, to ask for their prayers in addition to ours, and the, the but the touch of relics uh, often creates a very strong negative reaction from the demon. And I think people are very curious about exorcism uh, when it regards to uh, relics, perhaps, or, or people having turnarounds. How long does it usually take uh, for the whole process of exorcism over the course of days, weeks, months, years? What is the typical case like of uh, an exorcism that you're involved with? Well, the very fastest cases <clears throat> might be a, a six or eight weeks of one session a week that would be an hour or a few hours, that would be the absolute fastest. Uh, The typical is six months to two years to get all of the spirits that are in the person out, because it's not like Hollywood where there's just one. Mm -hmm. It's a whole colony of them that come in through different routes and different sins, uh, different unforgiveness that the person has. And so the, the average is about six months to two years, but many cases go five years or more. Amazing. Yeah, I think Hollywood gives us a different sense of, of how these things happen than happens in reality. We're talking today with Adam Bly, uh, the Paratus of Religious Demonology for the Diocese of Pittsburgh. He has a direct line of sight into this uh, phenomena that happens. And when we, when we talk about uh, possessions, perhaps, and perhaps there are different levels or different ways to describe it, is this something that you see once a year, once every few years? How often do you see someone who's possessed? Every week, every Friday. We, uh, we, we typically do three <laughs> to four different exorcisms every Friday afternoon. And these are different people coming in? Mm-hmm. So it's not uh, how uh, Hollywood or otherwise would like us to think that it's uh, just a very rare thing, but it's something that you deal with on a weekly basis. And... I think that um, one of the things that's fascinating about this is that we talk about um, 
knowledge, perhaps, that uh, that the person who's possessed has that they shouldn't, perhaps speaking in languages that they, they wouldn't normally know how to speak or knowledge or having information that uh, they couldn't have acquired. Is this something you run into as well, uh, dealing with uh, these spirits who have knowledge that is far above and beyond what, what the person would have in normal life? Sure. Yeah, the four classic signs of possession is knowing all languages, so schizophrenia doesn't make you suddenly fluent in ancient languages. Uh, Knowing things the person couldn't know, like the common thing they like to do is tell everyone in the room your most secret, embarrassing sins in detail. Um, If they've been confessed, they're not allowed to bring them up, but uh, they like to embarrass people that way. Sometimes they'll talk about just normal things in your life, but very specific. The third sign is to detect the holy. They can tell if something's blessed or not, just like a bottle of water or anything else, including relics like we talked about. And then the fourth one is strength beyond their condition in life, which is a, a kind of a, an amazing strength, and they never get tired. Incredible. And when we talk about these uh, events uh, that you are, you are witness to, how does how does it affect your faith? Of course, as we talked about, uh, you know, we, we focus on the light, on the good, uh, and, and the work of Jesus Christ and, and, and coming to conversion. Of course, you experience these uh, these situations that are uh, from the dark, and those are things that can also reaffirm sp- supernatural realities. What is what is the effect of, of this on your life of faith? Well, actually, Michael, it's a lot more positive than you would think. What it shows to me is reality that Jesus is present, he's everywhere. Mary is present with us during the prayers. The the holy angels are present with us. Um, I've seen Jesus respond to prayers just said in the mind, you know, in in the quiet of your heart during the session, asking for help with something specific in the session, and then the demon screaming out the the answer that's needed. Um, Oh boy, I mean, I've been praying a rosary for a case uh, in between sessions when the person was having trouble and have the demons testify later, well, it was the rosary you were praying that made us stop. <laughs> wow. You know, so it's a big affirmation of God and the fact that God's in charge. Not that God wants the demons to be doing these things, but he allows it because nothing can happen in creation without God allowing it. It's very much like the book of Job in the Bible. Amazing. We're talking today with Adam Bly about his new book, The Exorcism Files. Uh, This is an incredible book of uh, some uh, absolutely mind-blowing cases uh, relating to exorcism. One more case I'll ask you about today, Adam. There's uh, The final case in the book relates to uh, Stan with the the Ouija board and uh, the dangers that are inherent there. Tell, Tell the listeners, what was this case all about? Yeah, so this was a case, um, a person had been possessed possibly for their whole life um, because of something their parents did when they were, you know, before the age of reason, which is seven normally. Uh, But then what really caused the problem and made it get bad is they turned away from their Catholic faith and got deeply involved in the Ouija board, where it was an obsessive level of involvement. Like, get up in the morning, the first thing they did was consult the Ouija board about what they were supposed to do that day. Hmm. Then at the end of the day, they would consult it and get feedback on whether what they did that day was acceptable. Hmm. Um, And so it really became a dominating thing in their life. Um, And then, yeah, um, they went to a prayer session, kind of a deliverance prayer session, because they had a lot of vague, undefined problems in their life, and they suspected that there might be a spiritual component. And it it was not an exorcism, it um, it was actually an unbound session. And they started manifesting there, and uh, basically the people, you know, saw that and and knew what was going on and said, you need to call the diocese. And so they ended up coming in, and by the grace of God, it was a fast case. Um, Unlike the, you know, six months to two years we talked about, this one went pretty quickly. It was actually 11 weeks, uh, but it was very intense, and it was three to four days a week, for five or six hours a day, and it culminated um, with the actual Satan, and, you know, everybody always questions me, Uh, they want to second-guess that, but there was a number of things that made me confident it was the actual Satan. I had met him once before, um, 
and then it was Mary at the end that Jesus sent to cast him out. Amazing. Uh, well, we're so grateful to you, Adam Bly, for going through these uh, several cases with us today. And uh, we're so grateful to you writing this new book, The Exorcism Files, True Stories of Demonic Possession. It's out from Sophia Institute Press. It's in anywhere Catholic books are sold. People can get it uh, from the Sophia Institute uh, website as well. And just circling back, Adam, to the reason you wrote this book, what is your hope uh, for people who pick up this book uh, what are they going to learn? What are they going to gain? How is it going to help their faith uh, if people pick up this new book, The Exorcism Files? Well, the first thing I hope they gain is some education, so they're armed with more knowledge. And then the second thing I hope they gain is some trust and comfort in God, as opposed to the deceptive uh, false assistance that the demons offer, which is basically through the occult. I'm hoping that people will see enough there to avoid getting into trouble themselves. Wonderful. Well, we're so grateful to you, uh, Adam Bly, Paratus of Religious Demonology, Diocese of Pittsburgh, and author of this new book, The Exorcism Files, for joining us on today's show. And uh, good luck the rest of the month of October. I know it's a busy one for you. It is, Michael. Thank you, and God bless you, and God bless your listeners. God bless. That was Adam Bly, Paratus of Religious Demonology from the Diocese of Pittsburgh. Check out his brand new book, The Exorcism Files, True Stories of Demonic Possession. You're not going to believe what you read in this book. And that's all the time we have for today's show. If you missed any of this episode or want to catch up on past episodes, you can go to EWTN.com slash radio, check out the audio archives for Miracle Hunter, or download the free EWTN app. I'd like to thank our guest today, David Nallieri, the director and producer of Mother Teresa, No Greater Love. Check that one out in theaters, uh, MotherTeresaMovie.com on November 2nd will be your one chance to catch it. And also Adam Bly, talking to us as the Imperatus of Religious Demonology for the Diocese of Pittsburgh and author of The Exorcism Files, True Stories of Demonic Possession, brand new book out from Sophia Institute Press. And check out Explore with the Miracle Hunter. There's new episodes coming out on November 5th and beyond. Seven new episodes on Saturdays at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. And check out my book, Science and the Miraculous, How the Catholic Church Investigates the Supernatural, available from Tan Books. New episodes of They Might Be Saints and new episodes of Explore with the Miracle Hunter will be coming out. And new ones will be filmed in Poland and Lithuania in, in April of next year. If you'd like to be a part of that film crew, or be at least on the pilgrimage, I should say, you can go to pilgrimages.com slash miracle hunter and find out more about uh, that pilgrimage to Poland and Lithuania, where we'll be filming the next episodes of Explore with the Miracle Hunter. And I'd like to thank you for joining me today on Miracle Hunter, where from claims of healings and visions to the world's most inexplicable events, whether you're a believer or a skeptic, the truth is always worth the hunt. Talk to you next week.